Well, Joe, thank you so much for joining. Where are you coming in from? Where's that amazing library behind you? Thanks, Brendan. We're, uh, we're here in Austin, Texas. We moved here about four months ago with a lot of my friends. We're escaping the Bay Area and uh, joining the, the free state of Texas. Nice. Um, well, can you just start just quickly for people that are in the real estate industry that might not be as familiar with your just comprehensive background? If you were to give a cliff note to your background, how would you describe your role in tech? Uh, sure. Well, I guess I'm an entrepreneur and investor. I grew up in the Bay Area at Stanford Computer Science. I uh, had a bunch of smart friends. Uh, we were the national chess and math champions as a kid. And so I, I got convinced a bunch of them to build companies with me. And uh, my roommate from Stanford and, and I were backed by Peter Thiel. We started Palantir. I hired most of the team there in the first six years. After that, I started Adapar, which is a leading wealth management technology company, and OpenGov, another uh, company in the government space. And, and a lot of people who used to work for me were building companies. And so I was helping them mentor a lot of friends, build 15 or 20 companies. And, uh, and based on that, I ended up starting a fund about a decade ago. So now I run one of the large multi-billion dollar funds as, as, as you do as well. And we're uh, really focused on kind of helping entrepreneurs build and solve hard problems to, to fix big industries. Well, that's the, that's the fastest steamrolling through like tens of billions of dollars of enterprise value creation over your career. I've, I've, uh, I think I've ever heard. So uh, well, I, try, you know, try, try. <laughs> it brings up an interesting question, which is, you just moved to Texas. And I think everyone in the real estate industry is thinking through these big existential questions of like, we're in the midst of probably the most consequential demographic reshuffling that's ever happened, probably since, since we yeah. Louisiana purchased. And so since that's happening, I think what real estate owners want to know is like, where does Joe Lonsdale go and why? And so you moved to Texas. Can you just walk us through what was behind that rationale? And what do you see in Texas's future? And what do you think happens to California as a consequence? Sure. Well, you know, location, obviously, and, and people around you still matter a lot. You have all this remote work stuff going on, but, but you need to be around, at least for my business, you need to be around builders. And, and obviously, there's a lot of great builders in the Bay Area. I think it's a combination of frustrations with the Bay Area. Uh, a lot of the real estate industry there for a long time, uh, which was close to the government, made it very, very hard to build. It's, and, a lot of homeowners made it very, very hard to build. And so you haven't had new downtowns developed that would have naturally developed there. And, uh, and, and the cost of living is so high that when I hire people, it's very tough for them. Like if their spouse doesn't work as well, then 250K is not enough to, to, to live a middle-class life on, even for some of them, it's ridiculous. So, so, so the Bay Area has just been really tough for a long time. And then combine that with the city of San Francisco being run, managed terribly. I wrote a whole op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about moving out of there. So I won't go over through all of it. But there's just a lot of problems with California. And I think the bigger thing, is the state like the city in the area is problematic? The state has structural issues that make it very, very hard uh, to see California fixing itself over the next ten or twenty years. And so the real question is, what are the functional states that, that are, don't have those issues? And I think both, I think New York, California, Illinois have these very, very serious issues. And and I, and I don't see it getting better. I don't see the politics fixing it. I don't see people standing up to special interests and calling it out. Uh, I see the politics getting even worse, unfortunately. So so they, I think a lot of my friends who've seen that are saying, what are the functional states? And, uh, you know, Wyoming is very functional. Uh, Jackson Hole has some of the same problems that the Bay Area has in terms of like, you know, they give away 90% of the land. And so it's really expensive and poor people can't really live there. And even middle-class people, it's fine. So it starts finally expensive. So, so I want to be in a place where people of all, of all levels could live, but I also want to be near a great tech center. And I want to be in a place that's, that's close to a lot of places I go. So we've hired 600 people in Austin in the last three years for a bunch of my companies. And I have my brother and uh, friends here. And so Austin seemed like a great compromise. It's, it's a place, it's a great tech city. So I heard you say New York, California, Illinois are the- but Those are broken states. Those are broken states. The politics are structurally used. There's the pension debt. Which is not, it's not easy to fix them. They're, 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 they're in big, big trouble the next few decades. So, so let's say they're net losers, right? Of this kind of yeah. inward, uh, migration within the US. Texas, I totally get it. And I feel like every day I hear about a new company or- another entrepreneur that is relocating to Texas. Where else do you think wins? You know, people say Florida. Florida, Florida wins, Texas wins. I mean, Wyoming will get some. Um, you know, there's, I think Arizona really shots off in the foot uh, They with uh, with some of the new things they passed with taxes on high earners and all of that. So it's much less likely a lot of the top talent and a lot of top builders are going to want to be there now, which I think that was really too bad because there's other parts. Arizona was getting some. I think Colorado will keep getting some. There's a lot of markets in Colorado. They're very popular, obviously, Palantir. Moved to, moved to Denver and I have a lot of friends there. 
Um, you know, I, I think some of the rural areas are getting some. I have friends going to Montana who are builders. I have people who are trying to build up Oklahoma City. I mean, it's very, it's very interesting. There's a lot of like, well, we're third and fourth tier places that are becoming interesting to people because you can build little communities there very cheaply and very efficiently. So I think you're going to see a lot more of those. And so when you think about kind of venture capital ecosystems, right, which are these these kind of intermixings of talent and ideas and universities and capital all coming together. I think everyone knows the, the lore and the mythology around why Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley. It sounds like what you're saying is that we kind of transition towards a more multi-nodal model, meaning like if this were this were a PGA tour event and you know the the um, the favorite, all right, if you're betting on the favorite, what, you're, what really is happening is the field is likely to win, not the kind of here to four favorite, which is San Francisco. You know, I think I think my I think Miami and Austin have had so many great people go there that you're gonna have. I mean, I'm very bullish on on both of those cities because of all the top talents. But but yeah, so I think it's like I think it's like Miami, Austin. Like, and I'm I'm talking to a bunch of friends right now. There's you probably know there's you know people who are some of the richest people in the world who have moved here to, to Austin. who are really cool people, and there's a lot of chat about how do we build a new city nearby here? How do you build new communities nearby here? How do we make it ready to scale the much way it needs to scale? Because Austin's great. I mean, it's, it's not great to invest in real estate. I'm told by my real estate friends where there's too much open land around because prices don't go up so much. And Austin has lots of open land around. So even though prices have gone up a lot and even though I'm bullish, there's ways to build a lot more nearby here. You know, and so, so and of course then there's traffic, but then we have to build tunnels and so. I, I, I'm really bullish on the whole tunneling thing. I don't know if you guys think that's crazy, but I think I think that's like a cool, cool I, aspect of this too. I know you are. And Texas has got a lot of land and there's a lot of people with a lot of land who are going to need a lot of tunnels. So it's probably and, good business for you. And I, we're, we're Boring Company just relocated to, to Austin. So we're going to, we're, we're having some fun here with Steve Davis meeting everyone, the CEO of Boring Company to try to make sure we did tunnels. And that's going to be big for real estate people because wherever the tunnels go, that those areas are where you probably want to. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's a whole new, it's like three-dimensional, right, terrestrial roads. And it's really fun. It's really fun. You can dig, dig them 50, 60 feet underground and don't, you don't bother people at all who are above ground when you're digging. So you're going to be able to have some fun with this. And I want to ask you something else because obviously when we started Fifth Wall, um, 8VC was kind of the, you were like the first big new venture capital fund that kind of sprung onto the scenes and had made all these fantastic investments. And so I guess I'm curious, like your, your perspective as you've pioneered, right? Being young and building such an institutional investor, I guess when you went into it, how did you think about building 8BC differently than the established venture capital model? Sure. Well, and, 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 you know, there's a couple of different things. We think of ourselves a lot more like a company probably. So my team, a lot of established firms, there might be six partners and they each have their own deals and their own processes and own their own boards. And they, they'll debate with the partnership and they'll, and they'll get introductions from the partnership, but it's almost like six different firms kind of working in one. Right. Whereas our firm, is much, our firm is much more of like a company and a coherent operating company. And so I, I have nine partners and there's over 40 people in the firm, but they all complement each other. There's, there's like, it's like the X-Men where different people have different superpowers and depending on what we're working on, different people know it better than others or not. And so, so I, think, I, think, I, think, I think running it a company and we actually wanted to build like better way of tracking the network uh, and understanding the network. So we actually, my partner Drew and I, like we, we recruited these top two guys out of Stanford. These days, the kids coming out of Stanford and, and all the top schools that the best computer scientists, they get paid like 200K signing bonuses to go to Google or Apple or whatever. Uh, so the only way you can recruit them is to make, start a new company with them because they're not, they're not you know, so the only thing is higher status is doing a new company. Otherwise, they just go and take these jobs for tons of money. So we started this company to build our own CRM and to partner with our own, use AI to partner with all of our CEOs. That's called Affinity. And I guess Affinity is used by about 1,400 of the venture capitalists including, now. Including Fifth Wall. Is that good? Good. I appreciate <laughs> it. I appreciate it. And so, like, so we kind of had to rethink like how should we be managing our network in a way to coordinate with the whole team and how should we use our data to do that? And and, and you know, I think I think I think similar to you guys, we go really really deep on industries where we really get to know a lot of leaders in the industry, and, and we really we really have to build these kind of moats by by spending a lot of time. And as you have wins, it gives you more wins in the industry, and you kind of as you know it, just like you guys have done on real estate, it kind of builds on itself. So we've done a lot of that in logistics and healthcare and a few other places. And uh, so, so yeah, just being operational, going deep on industries, having having a corporation where everyone kind of works together and feels like they have equity in the whole thing versus just everything's my deal versus your deal. So there's, there's, there's a lot of different ways we've done that. And I think we run harder. I think we run like a startup. We run 80 hour weeks. And I think a lot of the old firms just, you know, did, weren't used to that. And they're being forced to do that now, but, but it's, it's just right. been a shift where this, our space is a lot hotter, you know? I went through this exercise and when I started uh, Fifth Ball, I think I called you as part of it. 
Uh, you were probably my, my last call because I wanted to hear what all the established venture funds said about like, hey, how would you build a venture fund from the ground up? And I guess yeah. over the process, I kind of formed my own thesis of like this weird conundrum of the venture capital industry invests in disruptive companies that rethink industries, rethink business models, reinvent with technology. Yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't rethink itself that way. It doesn't rethink itself, yeah. meaning it doesn't yeah. turn that introspectively. I yeah. guess, what's, your, what's the conclusion you've come to as to why they haven't? Why has the venture capital well, there's, there's never there's a certain artistry. There's a certain artistry they're very proud of, right? So, so a lot of these firms, and, and I think it's important to have this in, our, in your firm as well. And I have a couple of partners who are more this way than others, but it's just they're really proud of being great venture capitalists in the traditional sense of what a great venture capitalist is. And a great venture capitalist spends a ton of time on their deals and mentoring their entrepreneurs and those traditional mentorship. They put a bunch of money in early on and then they like help bring in other money that's for the company. And, and they just, and they, work, they just work closely and they only have any given time, five or six of these things they're working on. And, and their job is to be like the early stage investor and nothing else. And it's just like that. And, and, it, and just like, and there's like ways you do things and don't do things. And it's, there's a certain pride. It's like an artistry. It's like being like a blacksmith and like an artisanal. And so the industry has this sort of pride in art and the people who are the best at it all develop that pride and learn from each other. And Sequoia and Kleiner were the two that had that art at the highest. And they just, they did it a certain way for a long time. So I think, I think, I think, I think because of that artistry, it's been hard to step up and, and think about it. Like, is there another way we should be doing things that's separate? And I, there's, I think there's still a lot of wisdom in that artistry and a lot of, I think your DNA of our, your firm has to have some of that in it, but it can have, it can have new things as well. And there's going to be a dialectic between that old way and between some of these ways that we're talking about now. And honestly, Affinity is a great example of that, right? Because when you talk about the value of any institutional venture capital fund, it is the network, the, the constellation of relationships of Definitely. entrepreneurs and other VCs. But it sounds like what you've done is kind of industrialize and codify that and enable that with technology in a way that I think is, is really inspirational, right? Is something like firms like Fifthwall have, have tried to emulate. Um, yeah, you guys, you, guys have, you guys have done an amazing job in that in a couple of industries now too. So I, I guess I also wanted to ask you about, you have, I know, really interesting perspectives around data and privacy and some of the kind of ethical questions in, in that Pandora's box. Um, one of the areas that I think the real estate industry is today grappling with is a question around, as buildings become smarter, as, as they become more contextually aware of how people are interacting with the building, and this is true of both yep. commercial assets, buildings, but also homes, there's a lot more data, yeah. a lot more data. and meaning when we sign a lease or if a business signs a lease, they are not implicitly signing over information around their employees and what they're doing within a building, but effectively they are nowadays. How do you think the real estate industry should be reflecting on data privacy as a ethical quandary they're now faced with. Yeah, no, I think, I, think, I, think, I think the industry should both be using data in like much smarter ways as well as then be focusing on privacy. This is of course the core of Palantir. Palantir back in 2005, you know, 2006, 2007, when we, were, when we were first building it, we had a privacy board for the first time in the Valley, like 10 years before everyone else did. But the whole point of that is that you also are like doing things with data no one else is doing. So if I was thinking in real estate, I mean, my biggest experience with real estate data and real estate people uh, and, and from the everyday business life is like when I used to go around New York and LA all the time, you'd literally get to the bottom of the building and wait in line. And it's just like, it's really obnoxious experience. And like, if I was running one of those firms, like I would be using data and I'd be seeing exactly who's coming in on my building. And if it was an important person coming in if the CEO of a big company came in who I wanted to do business with, I'd have one of the people walk from behind the desk right away as they enter the door. And I'd say, you know, hello, hello, hello Mr. Smith. It's wonderful to, to meet you. Our chairman's waiting for you upstairs. Let me escort you up. I wouldn't make them stand in line and get a stupid little card and go scan it at the gate. I and mean, this is, just, this is just like, there's ways of using data to do these things, but like in so much better ways in and out of the building and interacting with people. And, and like, like yeah, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just it's crazy to me how bad the data interaction is in real estate. And it's like, maybe it hasn't really mattered too much, but I'd be curious to see if stuff like that does matter going forward between buildings and in between others. And then of course, if you are doing that, the only way to do that is to have all the privacy stuff and is to do the privacy stuff better. But I'm, I'm not even convinced they're doing anything that smart with it yet. So I, just, you know, you only, only have to spend the money on the privacy if you're going to, today is going to be helping you to begin with, I guess is my question. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny. I use that example whenever we go in and we talk to a lot of real estate owners, whenever I go in and answer their question around why should we, you know, invest in technology? I'm like, I just walked into your building and downstairs, that was the most anachronistic experience. Like that literally could have happened in the 1950s. The same thing yeah. that I just went through where I signed like a physical paper and someone 
took my ID. It's, it's comical, yeah. What, what's your explanation as to why the real estate industry, probably more so than almost any major industry, has just missed on technology? It almost feels like the real estate industry missed the entire internet all of mobile. And then around like 2015 had this like age of enlightenment and was like, oh yeah, the tech is a thing. Let's go do something. Why, why could they get away with that that long? Well, there's probably, and you would probably know this better than me, but there seems to be a lot of parts of it where like, even though the experience of entering and exiting the building is kind of obnoxious, it, does, it hasn't been the thing that's determined their profits very much. It's probably been like a smaller determinant of their profits. So the parts, the parts where it's like a bigger determinant of their profits are probably the parts where you get technology first. Um, and then, and then and it's partially, I think it's also partially just because it's a very bespoke industry with a lot of families that have done things the same way for a long time. And, and, and it's, it's, it's worked very well. I mean, you know, no, you know, everyone's always talks about the last 40 years of interest rates, just going down, 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 down. Like if you're, if you were smart enough to go big and buy stuff in real estate in the last 40, 50 years, you've just made money consistently. So if you're making money consistently, you don't need to change what you're doing. You don't need to adapt to technology. Like you're making money anyway. So, so, so I, I don't, I don't think there's been pressures. Like things only change when there's really strong incentives and really strong pressures and they're forced to. And, and so, you know, I think there has been a new generation of younger people from these families that are, that are leading families and the young people come in and they know technology and they're used to it and they're not seeing it in their business. And they're like, this is ridiculous. Let's fix it. And that, that, that's been great. Uh, but I, th I think the only areas where it's really starting to change more are the areas where it really impacts the bottom line and where they have to do it for their business. I totally agree. And it, it, it's interesting because the real estate industry is this like very weird industry where it's inherently monopolistic, right? Because if you have a building that occupies a particular yeah. piece of land, no one else can have a building there. It's like definitionally monopolistic. Yeah. But it's also like debt financed, right? It's like debt and equity financed. It's like largely a low human capital industry, yeah. low IP industry. And if you think about like, I don't think you're supposed to say that on the YouTube. <laughs> no, you, you, totally, you can totally say that. I say that to the real estate industry all the time. But then you contrast that with, with tech, right? Where you have an all equity finance business, right? Where it's high human capital, high IP. It's like that, that mental leap to go from understanding value in something like Boring Company, right? Which is so out there to most real estate owners and understanding how they should be opportunistic about that is so foreign to them when they've owned a building at 101 Main Street and generated cash flow with leverage yeah. for the last yeah. 30 years. No, I think, I think, I think that's right. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's the new stuff is, yeah, the new stuff is, is pretty unintuitive. I, I do think you're right that the things are being completely rewritten right now where there's going to be a lot of pressures on this industry. There's going to be a lot of people are moving. The values are changing. The opportunity right now is probably bigger than it's ever been in this industry in the last 30 or 40 years for people who are actually very calculated and very smart and aware of how this change is happening and, and things like the tunnels, things like new cities, uh, things, you know, probably think things like how you, how you make your building more attractive. That stuff probably really matters right now. So especially I, mean, I, I wouldn't want to be in commercial real estate owning much assets in these cities where people are moving out, being smart about if you do own those assets, how to make them attractive. There's probably a lot to do right now with tech. Joe, it's always so interesting just getting your thoughts. And I just have to say like what you built at, at ABC has been so, I think, inspirational for a lot of, young GPs that, that started funds learning, you know, and seeing a young firm grow so fast and have such success in its investing. So, um, well, awesome. I really, I really, I, really, I mean, it's a lot coming from you. You guys, you guys are one of the top new firm built in the last 10 years by far, if not more than a couple tops. So, so thank you very much for that. Of course. Well, thanks, Joe. All right. Thanks, Brandon. Take care.